you. So yeah, as uh, I think Jeff kind of mentioned there, I mean, I've I've been um, I've had a career in the music industry that has spanned 24 years so far. Um, some of it's been slightly, uh, you know, edge of the seat stuff, just kind of surviving. Um, I've always been. Um, I've always been very kind of independent-minded, I guess, as far as uh, my own music goes. I got burnt very early on in my career, um, you know, going down the, the road of major label deals, um, which I'll just touch on briefly. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was classically trained. Um, I did a degree in music at Exeter University, and, um, and I uh, majored in original composition. So... Even though I had a, I had a at that time I had a kind of a great love of thrash metal, acid house, and classical music. Um, you know, I was trained in the art of composition, and I, when I was at Exeter, um, I actually wrote a, uh, a piece for string quartet, a twelve-piece choir, um, uh, a bunch of synthesizers, some keyboards, a narrator, someone with some paint. And uh, what else was in there? It just a, a whole bunch of nonsense, basically. But I man the point. The point is, I managed to manuscript it all, and um, and conduct a performance of it as part of my um, finals. Uh, and from there, I kind of, I've basically had a career that's, uh, you know, my very first release was 24 years ago under the name Scatix, which was a kind of little techno thing that I that I started out on. I then moved on to uh, being in a band called Flicker Noise, um, Lunatic Calm, uh, where I had a you know fair bit of success with movie licensing, etc. Um, I was also Fracar, I was Synchromesh, um, Double Black, Killer Elite, um, Elite Force, as some of you may know me, um, Zodiac Cartel, and most recently I feel like I've kind of shed a lot of skin and. Um, I'm now Simon Shackleton, so <laughs> it's a kind of roundabout way of finding your identity. Hi, yes, not good to meet you all. So yeah, you know, so it, it's uh, I, what I'd like to do is just sort of briefly touch on that journey that um, that has seen me arrive at the point that I'm currently at. So some of the things I wanted to touch on tonight, because I know there are, there are obviously the, there's a lot of people here who are pretty skilled with various, you know, music production tools and there are a fair few people that aren't as well so I just want to try and you know get a nice balanced um, discussion uh, about all kind of aspects of things really but I, you know one of the things I want to talk about tonight is uniqueness um, hybridization and that kind of independent thinking and looking for ways as an artist to impart heart and soul really in, in in what we do i think you know a lot a, a lot of time as a producer during my career i've um you know i've kept both eyes on the marketplace i've looked at what other people are doing um sometimes i've uh, borrowed um what other people are doing sometimes i've ripped it off wholesale sometimes i've created it very much originally myself and i've kind of i've always loved particularly with electronic music what you know what this scene and what this technology allows us to do you know just being able to cherry pick ideas from pretty much anything we want you know we have the technology to do any, uh, you know anything but i think at the end of the day one thing that i've learnt over the years particularly with this boom in technology that we all have and we're all sitting at these amazing terminals and you know we have everything at our fingertips the, the one thing that i've learnt above all is that a good idea um, is still just a good idea, and they're still as precious as they were 15, 20, 100 years ago. And they're also equally as hard to come by. You know, having, having this huge array of tools at our fingertips can sometimes be, um, you know, extremely distracting, I guess. And I, I would imagine a lot of music producers out there would probably say, <laughs> you know, agree and say the same thing. I mean, I've... I've spent my fair share of time over the years going around in circles, you know, chasing the latest sound, the latest plug-in, and um, 
really with this album that I've just finished as Simon Shackleton and this kind of unveiling of my sort of true self as an artist, I've really tried to, to leave that, um, that ethos behind. And I've really just tried to focus on the quality of the ideas um, and the musicality behind those ideas. So, you know, going back to Exeter, I was, I was really, I was super lucky actually. I, I, I went through college there at a time where I was blessed with a, a, a bunch of very, very talented friends. And I guess, <coughs> you know, a, a lot of you who are actually studying here will probably have a very similar experience where you've, you've met people who have maybe become mentors to you, become great friends, you've become collaborators. But ultimately, you're, you know, you're, you're in a really lucky space here where you're able to collaborate with one another, you're able to try ideas out, and it's never been easier to share those ideas and concepts with each other. So at Exeter, um, amongst the people I was pretty close to were um, Tom York from Radiohead. Um, as I've mentioned before, I mean, we, we formed bands together. He was the reason I ended up taking up DJing. Um, I basically took his job when he left to do some Radiohead thing, a misguided <laughs> idea he had, I don't know, yeah, still, just don't, f what a waste, <laughs> yeah, just don't, f <laughs> never, f never forgiven him. Um, <laughs> and the guy who took on the, the job of the student DJ after I left was Felix Buxton um, from Basement Jacks. Um, uh, also at Exeter around the same time was uh, Matthew Herbert. And then we also had some really great journalists like Frank Tope, who went on to edit Mix Mag in the early 90s. Um, Toby Amis, who went on to become a, a really respected TV presenter. Um, and then we also had filmmakers like Abby Morgan, who's recently won a, a BAFTA, I think, in the UK for her screenplays, and Nicholas Abrahams, who um, he was a, a bit more of a renegade figure. He used to make movies of people's shit that they did in the backyard but that's a that's a whole different story <laughs> for another day but it, the bottom line is it was a really really creative bunch of people and i think you know it took me um it took me quite a few years after i left exeter to really appreciate what an opportunity i had there and i you know i think i think for you guys that are lucky enough to be studying together you know don't lose sight of the fact that it's a really really cool opportunity um, so yeah, I mean, back then the um, it was the sort of late eighties, really, and the you know the musical landscape was was very much one of hybrids. Um, Acid House <coughs> in the UK was a lot more than um, a sound. It was a it was actually a revolution. You know, it was a socio political revolution. The decision to dance and to go out to these kind of illegal raves that people were putting on actually put you in direct conflict with the police, which, you know, was <laughs> kind of unheard of, really. When it Certainly nowadays, when it comes to clubbing, it's a very sort of, um, it's a, it, you know, it's a very asinine, it's a very uh, controlled experience. But back then, you really did make a decision that um, if you went out to dance and you were determined to dance, the police would often get in the way and you know, fights broke out, they tried to seize people's sound systems, etc. So, it, you know, it really was, um, it was a, a bold decision that people took to make that music. And, and contrary to what a lot of people think about Acid House, you know, those parties, the Acid House parties back then were not, they were not just about the 303 and the 909 and the kind of squelch of the acid. I mean, people would play you know, the Happy Mondays, the Stone Roses. It was a really, it was really about eclecticism. It was a really, really broad mix of music. And that inspired me hugely. And at around the same time, there were all kinds of different hybrid spin-offs happening, like, um, you know, the sort of early jungle breakbeat prototypes. Um, there was rock and rap that were colliding for the first time. Um, you know, the likes of Anthrax, Public Enemy, Rage Against the Machine. Some of the breakbeat prototypes for me were people like Renegade Soundwave, the On You Sound System, Depth Charge, just people who were um, really pushing the envelope of, of sound and, and looking for these kind of really exciting um, hybrids. And actually for me, you know, back then, hip-hop was at its most exciting because it was a period where really, <laughs> you know, in a lot of ways I think that um, copyright law hadn't 
really caught up with music. So, you know, you just had this amazing palette of anything that you could you could dip into, and it was inspiring, you know. And and I, I love the fact that you still get people doing bootlegs, and you still get people kind of being very imaginative, I even though, you know, a lot of the major labels have kind of really, like, tried to crack down on, uh, you know, and, and unfortunately have, have made it almost impossible to get things licensed. But just that, you know, that... Um, that sense of e experimentation and, and of anything goes was such a it was such a sort of valuable and passionate um, encounter really with music and interface with with music. You know the other the other big sort of sounds for me at the time that that really um, were major hybrid sounds is the sort of industrial music, where you had <coughs> you know the likes of, uh, sort of early Nine Inch Nails, Ministry, Young Gods, who I, I was a big fan of. Um, and also Belgian New Beat, who were taking bits of acid house, bits of, you know, bits of electro, and um, and 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 you know, bits of sort of industrial music. Um, <coughs> so yeah, so it was it was a really exciting time to be at college. I became a student DJ. I immersed myself in dance music culture and and just started to experiment um, making it. Had a, the most basic setup. Had this terrible sort of D twenty. Roland workstation. I don't know if anybody remembers those, but my God, they just did nothing. You know, <laughs> everything had to be done under the hood. And and uh, you know, I mean, I've heard a lot of people talk about about Acid House and how you know <laughs> you get all these kind of apocryphal stories about how um, you know the first Acid line happened when uh, DJ Pierre's. 303 unit ran out of batteries on his way to the studio and he plugged it in and this kind of wonky sound came out and Acid House was born. <laughs> but it <laughs> you know the the point is is what what was interesting for me with the D20 is it pushed me beyond what the technology was available and and just you know and and I became very very creative and uh, you know uh, something that in in this age now of ultimate choice I think it's always a, a really cool step back to take sometimes just you know take a single plug in take a single keyboard um give yourself a project you know really really get under the hood of that thing really understand what makes it tick w you know find find the sound that it was never meant to make and i think you you've you know you've you've started to develop an understanding of what you're create you know what you're actually able to create so a lot of those workstations like the one i used was you know, it was it was about those kind of horrible slap bass demos that you <laughs> used to hear that showcased every sound, but sounded just I, I don't even know what they were thinking. But um, so for me, it was it, you know I was stuck with that for three years, and it was a really good opportunity to learn um, you know the real kind of nuts and bolts. And I you know I left I left Exeter, um, I kind of outgrew it in a lot of ways, and moved up to London. Um, really tried to sort of better myself and after a year or two of banging my head against a brick wall um basically signed a development deal publishing deal which was awesome because actually back then to create a a, a, a genuinely listenable demo um it, it cost about 10 grand um 10,000 pounds that is so 16,000 dollars um just to assemble you know, some basic kit. And then, actually, if you're ever going to release something, you'd need to go into a studio that was going to charge you five or $600 a day. So, you know, I think that's worth bearing in mind when you're next sat down in front of your <laughs> laptop with a fast Wi-Fi connection and literally the world is at your fingertips. But it was it was a genuine struggle to um, just, just to realise your ideas. Um, and, you know, something I learned from that as well was that, you know, when you become confident with your setup, regardless of what it is, um, there are fewer and fewer barriers to what's up there um, actually coming out. And and I think that's a really important thing to realise as well when you're faced with this kind of myriad of choice. Ultimately, a good idea is a good idea, and you know, um, it's you can you can get completely shredded by by choice, it's sometimes a great plan just to just to hone things down and just and just completely focus on um, on that idea. So basically, we got a publishing deal. We um, 
you know, gradually worked our way up as Lunatic Calm. We released a, a big album in 97, which um, was fortunately licensed to The Matrix and to Charlie's Angels, Spider-Man, Arlington Road, The Jackal, a whole bunch of stuff. And then we took to the road around the US and toured with The Crystal Method um, on multiple occasions, uh, just around the time they had their Vegas album out. And that was a, that was an amazing, <laughs> amazing journey for us, you know, finding ourselves in places like Omaha, um, you know, on a Wednesday night, and uh, you know, just these three kind of very white boys from um, from the UK just just really had no concept of what was out there. But actually, those gigs, if anything, were the were the highlights of that tour because you you know you were kind of going into these towns where people had rolled up at midday the whole parking lot was just full of cars sound systems just people out there drinking and, and it was such a major event you know you have people saying we've had no electronic music coming through town in 15 months or something and it was you know it felt like a revolution was happening and you know the crystal method guys i think particularly out here um i think they they genuinely pioneered a, 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 a huge kind of um, revolution of their own in, in that, you know, that the they've managed to get electronic music in some shape or form played on, on US radio. And really, fair play to them for achieving that because it, it, it wasn't easy. <laughs> um, but anyway, so we did that for... Um, we did that for three or four years and then eventually um, we got pretty much burned by record companies. And then I went solo as a leap force for my own record company, Fused and Bruised, and kind of spearheaded the second generation of really young uh, breakbeat acts, um, following on from the pioneers of the genre who I you know, describe as people like Ace and Alternate, The Prodigy, Shut Up and Dance, Sons of the Loop, The Loop Era, Dust Brothers, aka The Chemical Brothers. And, you know, my take on breaks really was always that it was. Um, uh, I was talking to somebody today about this, and, and actually back in the, the mid-90s, there was no breaks at all as a genre. It was um, really not until Adam Freeland and Rennie Pilgrim kind of coined the term new school breaks in 97 that, that it really existed. So there was breakbeat music, but it was basically anything that didn't fit anywhere else into a category was called eclectic. So, you know, I was an eclectic DJ, and I didn't really recognize that term and I kind of you know this like hybridization um, always excited me and so kind of moving forward with even with Elite Force you know I I just wanted to cherry pick all these different things that were shiny and exciting and I you know and I, I just wanted to have this this very kind of authentic creativity um, to what I did um, so yeah, released a couple of albums, uh, No Turning Back and Modern Primitive. Um, had complete nightmares with distribution companies going bust because this was basically the early 2000s was, um, was really when uh, the digital world properly um, got hold. And um, you know the, the traditional vinyl distributors at the time were going bankrupt like you wouldn't believe. So I had a you know the 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 story of um my second album on primitive was particularly tragic and if you just indulge me a minute I'll explain what happened so basically I've been working on this album um absolutely loving my life this album and I you know finally got everything together the artwork the music the final CDs came back um I think it was 20 months in the making um everything got delivered <coughs> to the warehouse uh for Monday morning to, to go out uh, to all the stores. And when all the vans turned up to deliver it on the Monday morning, um, there was a big chain around the warehouse and the place had gone bust. Um, it took four months before the official receiver, the administrator had come in um, and offered me the opportunity to buy back my own album um, at a dollar per unit. <laughs> um, now, you know, that was kind of the only thing I had at the time. So, you know, I needed to try and make some money back. So I bought my own album back for a dollar a unit. Um, had, a, you know, a couple of pallet loads of these things. Spent six weeks, six or seven weeks trying to get 
the world out there excited again about the fact that this product was going to be re-released. Um, took it to another distributor called Amato, who were, you know, pretty big fish back then. And um, again, the material went to them um, four days before it was due out. They went bust. <laughs> And um, sure enough, about six weeks later, the <laughs> administrators were on the phone again. Uh, you fancy buying these back for another dollar? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm sure there's some kind of weird, twisted business model in there somewhere for somebody. Maybe the people who made the CDs in the first place. But at that point, you know, I, I basically, you know, I think I bought maybe a hundred copies of it and the rest just got torched because, I, you know, I, I didn't have anywhere to put them and I didn't want to buy them all back for a second time, but you know we live in a we live in a very different era now, and obviously it was um it was a it was a sign of the times, and um you know things have just changed hugely. You know Beatport was founded in two thousand and four, and things kind of quickly migrated over to um to downloads, and then you know a few years later we're kind of getting up to two thousand nine two thousand and ten, um I you know, was really at that point just looking at um, income from MP3s was was really minimal. So for a lot of producers, it became not so much about the production, but it came it became about DJing and just driving that demand towards the dance floor. So you know, I uh, I effectively um, took the bull by the horns and invented the revamp. Um, and the revamp, the idea of it was it was really, I used to key all of my records. So I had a, had a music collection of, I still do, had a music collection at the time of six or 7,000 tunes that I had on CD, massive bags full of CDs. Um, but everyone was in key. Um, so actually when it came down to studio projects, I was like, oh, I could take a, could take a bass line from that one. I really like the drums on that tune. Um, so that's a great lead line. What if I start actually taking these tunes, just literally grabbing them, going almost going back to that old breakbeat hardcore mentality of like anything goes, and, you know, fuck these people, I don't care, it's just not going to matter. So I started just grabbing all this stuff, and it worked really well. You know, th th these tunes were effectively new tunes, but they were completely cannibalized from other people's work, and. Um, you know, and I just I was just using them to DJ with, and I, you know, my DJ work was going up and up, and then I decided I'd, uh, you know, try and get licenses and put an album together, and that was that was an insane project because you were going to record companies saying, right, we've got seven tracks we're trying to license here, there's going to be no money in it for you because it's, 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 you know, that much of a percentage. So you know, I got some amazing deals out of these record companies where they'd be like, oh, we just you can have it for 50 quid or, you know, they did actually didn't really understand what I was asking for. So, you know, <coughs> me and my manager at the time, we just had this huge list of tracks and we got nearly everything licensed that we want for very, very little money. And we put it out on um, Beatport with a really orchestrated campaign. And um, we sold, I think that year alone, we sold about $40,000 worth of business on, on that album alone, on those tracks. And not only that, because it was because it was m the, the the tracks had you know there was a Wolfgang Gartner component in there that we had licensed. There was a you know um, a, a Dead Mouse uh, component, and so each track had five or six different people. And, and obviously, because we'd had them licensed on Beatport, we could list all of those artists as part of the tracks, which was awesome because they had a huge number of followers, and they just appeared in everybody's stream so you know we we it was a, it was a really really great um it was a great project actually and when we came back to doing the second one about 18 months later i don't think we got one single license off anybody <laughs> they were like no, fuck that. you know absolutely no way not without you know everyone wanted huge amounts of money for it so you know had a whole bunch of years really after that where i was just properly focusing on driving all of my music towards the dance floor um Revamp 2, 2012, I did 18 tracks, each one for free over 18 weeks. And that was great for building a mailing list. So it had some currency. It was a different kind of currency, but it was, um, you know, it was diving into that notion of information being power, effectively, and your kind of control of your um, database, meaning that you could mobilize well. 
Revamp 3 in 2014, I did very differently, where I did three 12 inch singles, um, designed a, uh, a kind of graffiti template, and then stood in my shed at my farm just spraying the living daylights out of these things, each one by hand, and did that very much as um, a unique kind of director fan. Sale. Are any of those still up on like Bandcamp or anything, Simon? Um, well, you know, I was moving house the other day actually, and um, and I have um, I just dug a, f a a few out. I mean, they sold out within a few days. I'm just, just wondering if you can show them to anybody online. Do you have them up on your Bandcamp or anything that you could pull up? No, they're gonna they are they're gonna they're gonna be going up very soon. You Makes know, in the sense. next few weeks, we've got you know we've got kind of plans to reissue. There's a lot of old lunatic calm vinyl and things like that 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 I discovered so um so yeah so uh, you know that's kind of where uh, where I got to effectively and you know and I I just just felt around about 2014 that you know I I'd kind of taken this as far as I really wanted to it felt it it, it you know my music making had f it had become quite soulless in a way it was everything was driving demand to to the dance floor so you know I embarked on um on uh, starting to write some music as Simon Shackleton and um, uh, you know a lot of that I think came out of my um, Burning Man adventures so you know I, st I started going to the burn in 2009 and um, I haven't missed one since actually although this year will be the, f the first that I will be missing um, and what it did for me is it just reinstilled a real sense of kind of heart and soul and um, you know I just began making much more kind of um, experience driven and, and emotive music and, and all of a sudden while I was making this album it just occurred to me that I really didn't need to I really didn't need to push um, my music to the dance floor anymore and that was you know just such a huge liberation um, for me you know I also felt while I was at the burn that you know I'd understood over time that I kind of lost what makes me truly happy um creatively you know i'd found it in other people's work when i was out on the plier musically uh, you know music sculpture um performance art whatever you know i'd found a lot out there that um that just completely blew me away particularly from a point of altruism you know making music because it you need to make music you know as a, as a musician and i kind of put these 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 worries about um you know about driving my dj um work behind me and i started a series called the one series um which really which really aimed to take a big chunk of that heart and soul from the sets that i felt you know that what i felt i was getting from those those sets those dj sets at burning man into the kind of default world and um and for me that was a you know it was a pretty sort of spectacular um turning point really um and it, you know, it really did, um, it really did sort of inform the heart of this album that I've, you know, that I've that I've been making. So I want to kind of leave all the historical stuff just about there. I, mean, I don't know if anyone's got any questions they want to throw at me at this point. Well, I have some water. I'm curious. You were talking about. Oh, thanks. I was curious. You were talking about uh, the crystal method. Was it the crystal method bringing yeah. electronic music to the radio here? Yeah. I was wondering, and I wonder if anyone else this resonates with anyone else in the room. But like the mid '90s, like early '90s, the Hacker soundtrack was like a really Interesting, popular yeah. album. Yeah. That's like how all my friends got into electronic music. I think. Yeah. I was curious if it was similar in w when when you were coming up. Yeah. I mean, what I d that I guess was quite a kind of an, uh, an American, um, d you know, experience to an extent. I mean, I I, d I did feel that. In the UK, you know, we had a we had quite a rich heritage for dance music that preceded that, and and because of the the size of the size of the UK, it's very very easy for music to spread. You know, we have the BBC, which is syndicated national radio that comes for free out of everybody's radio. So, you know, you would have you have Pete Tong, for example, doing a show way way back in the day, and you know, if he chose something as his sort of single of the week, it would be huge you know it would be an instant kind of hit so that i think the ability for for news of music to travel was just much it was much easier in 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 the uk and it did feel for us it was very weird for us as a band you know coming out here for the first time because it just it just felt like it was properly on that 
kind of tip of innovation. It, it, you know, we, we just weren't expecting it. We were just thinking we'd be touring with another band, and um, it wasn't like that at all. I mean, was it, was there anything else for you guys that around that time, if anyone can remember that far back, um, that that was a major influence? Yes. Uh, the Wipeout game. Yeah. Actually, that Wipeout game was a, was was quite a key thing. I think that was maybe 1996 or something. But the soundtrack was phenomenal to that game. You know, whoever licensed it went absolutely crazy. It was all distinctive stuff, wasn't it? Well, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It was you, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it wasn't <laughs> me. But but I, I loved all that music. It was a big deal. Mm. Yeah. Here you go, man. Grab this mic. Yeah, for me it was like Paul Gunfold Transport CD one. I'm yeah. not sure why, but I listened to that about a billion times. Wow, yeah. fantastic! Yeah, I mean he, you know, Oakenfold was uh, he. I guess he was doing a lot out here. Um, I mean, he was big in the UK as well, but I, you know, I guess he pretty much resonated out here. He he, he worked hard as well out here, which a lot of, you know, a lot of DJs from from the UK kind of didn't so much back then. It was you know they had their fan base and they had their, you know, their their rich fancy lifestyles and stuff so <laughs> you know any more questions yeah so you s geez <laughs> it's a little loud I'm gonna hold this way over here. that's good um, so you said you're working on your album mm. and you went to Burning Man and you had something click in your head yeah that made you realize like you should just be making music for you like so you can find your happiness and everything instead of just making it for the dance floor yeah was there anything in specific that clicked in your head, or what, what was it that made you realize that? Uh, I, you know, I think I think really at the burn for me, it was it was just the fact that I could be free. You know, as a DJ, as, as much as anything. You know, obviously I didn't go there to to encode music or anything, but you know, it just just being a DJ and feeling, you know, the f the first year I went there was very much a sort of dipping my toe in and 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 getting out, um, getting out of the burn. But I remember. You know, when I when I when I came back, um, I had I used to shut my eyes at night in bed for literally six weeks, and all I could see were art cars driving around in there. You know, it's <laughs> it's quite insane. I thought I was going crazy, but I had to go back the next year just to see if I was or wasn't. But yeah, you know, it was. It, and th and the second year when I went back, I did um, some friends of mine at the um, at the Nuts Camp in invited me to come and play at Sunrise, and. Um, and that was a big turning point for me because all of a sudden, you know, I wasn't playing a peak time set. I was playing something different and it made me feel very different. You know, and I really, I really tried to listen to my gut and listen to my feelings when I was DJing, which I always do. But usually at that time in my career, you know, I was just always booked to play fire and brimstone, you know, one and a half, two hour sets at the peak time, just like just kicking people's faces off. And... Um, <laughs> You know, and that whilst that's that has its sort of benefits now and again, it was really nice just to get into this sort of oh, it's just like everyone's really mellow and they're drinking champagne and that guy's got a barbecue and he's making me bacon. This is just too <laughs> much, <laughs> man. And I'm just DJing while it's happening. It was just <laughs> awesome. So yeah, you know, I mean, there were there were it was it was m more than anything. What I took away from that is is just this um, this notion that I was literally barely scratching the surface of what what was you know what I was capable of and and what I wanted to do so you know it definitely started a journey of you know trying to trying to get that marketing mindset out and and just starting and and what's been very interesting I think with the one series um and just seeing it grow in San Francisco um has has just been how 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 drawn to that people have become as well that it's you know it's not something that I've had to promote all that heavily you know i think i think that 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 sort of um authenticity and and just genuine self-expression i think really kind of shines through in it so Th this will be fun who's been to a one series in here show of hands who's seen simon dj in one of his incarnations or another okay all right sweet well good call thank you thank you anybody <laughs> go see him with scumfrog this weekend See? Oh, nice. Well done. You're still standing. That's excellent. 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 Back to yeah. you. <laughs> so yeah, I just, I, you know, I'm going to kind of move into a little bit more of the sort of specific musical stuff now. Um, 
If you're a music producer, subscribe to our channel and stay up to date on the latest PureMind tutorial videos, track breakdowns, elite sessions, and more. Visit us at PureMind.com.